Welcome to Drilling Deep. I am your host, John Kingston. We're going to talk about drilling a little today because it's the name of the show and it is in the news this week. And you need to drill to get oil and you need oil to make diesel. That's why we call the show Drilling Deep. We also have our guest of the week. Our topic again is cybersecurity. It's a big story in recent months here with a couple of pretty prominent logistics companies having been hit with major hacks. Teresa Lanowitz of AT&T is on the case and she's here to talk about it with us. We try not to get too political here, but we're going to need to make an exception today. This past week, Donald Trump was asked by Sean Hannity about charges he would be a dictator if he returned to the White House. He said he would be on day one, and that one of the things he would do on day one is drill, drill, drill. So let's look at the record. There is a narrative out there from people who haven't looked at the data that there has been a collapse in U.S. hydrocarbons production under Joe Biden. There is no subtle way of saying that. Nothing could be further from the truth. The weekly Energy Information Administration data on production, consumption, and inventories has been showing U.S. crude production for several weeks now at 13.2 million barrels per day, though the most recent report showed it slipping to 13.1 million barrels per day. The weekly numbers are considered less accurate than the monthly numbers that, operating on, that operate on a two-month lag. But the report that came out at the end of November, reflecting September data, affirmed that, yes, production in that month averaged about 13.2 million barrels per day. And guess what? That's a record high. And then there is the question of total production of hydrocarbons. Estimates of total world consumption and production are not just of crude. They are of all petroleum liquids, which includes natural gas liquids such as pro propane and butane, and it also includes biofuels, even though, yes, I know, biofuels are not petroleum. So when it was reported by the EIA that world consumption of, so when it's reported that world consumption of petroleum is 102 million barrels per day, it includes those other products, not just crude. In that most recent EIA monthly report, U.S. output of total liquid hydrocarbons was 19.9 million barrels per day. That is a record. In the month that Joe Biden took office, it was 16.3 million barrels per day. Ah, but what about the rig count? That's the weekly number produced by both Baker Hughes and a company called Enervis that measures the number of rigs drilling. Isn't it way down? Actually, in the Biden years, it's up. It was 378 the week he took office. Now, granted, that was still in the middle of the pandemic. And it rose as high as 780 a year ago. Now it's 625. And that's sort of the point. Drilling has gotten so much more efficient that old correlations between the rig count and production have deteriorated. Back when oil production was near these current levels at the end of 2019, the rig count was a lot higher. And yet the amount of oil coming out of the ground was a little less. This industry just keeps doing it better. Oh yeah, and let's not forget natural gas. Its output in the U.S. is at or near an all-time high also. Look, I have serious issues with some of the energy policies of the Biden administration. The cancellation of Keystone XL was an act of virtue signaling that did nothing but put oil on trains instead of a new pipeline. Its continued attempt to slow, to slow walk development rights in the Gulf of Mexico is self-defeating. And they should probably stop talking about the end of oil because long-term capital expenditure decisions are being made with those words ringing in their ears. But even with those words, it just isn't happening. Let's look at a little more news from this week. ExxonMobil said this week it is going to be increasing its capital spending over the next four years. Some of that is going to be in low carbon spending, but overall spending is going to go from 23 to 25 billion next year, or this year, to as much as 27, oh, excuse me, 23 to 25 billion next year to as much as 27 billion in 2027. The estimate had been 20 to 25 billion in spending through 2027, and the U.S. Permian Basin is a key target of that spending. Meanwhile, Chevron spending also announced this week is expected to increase 11% next year compared to this year, and the U.S. is a big target of that spending. And this isn't new. I went back and found an analysis from the Energy Information Administration that said capital expenditures in the first quarter of this year rose from the fourth quarter of 2022, even though prices were lower. 
Groups like the American Petroleum Institute get paid to complain that the federal government is making their lives untenable. If you go on the API website and scroll through their press releases, the headlines alone are a compendium of a forecast that this regulation or that rule is going to cause untold havoc in the oil and gas industry of the U.S. And that's not to say that some of those views are always incorrect. I may agree with a lot of them, but they always say things like that, even as their members are delivering record output of hydrocarbons here at the close of 2023. Something is not computing. Right now, with oil prices sliding, there is no doubt who the biggest enemy of OPEC Plus's efforts are to keep prices in check. It is the U.S. of A., and in its rip-roaring oil industry, even as it labors under a president who supposedly is killing it. Might want to double-check that narrative. We're going to move on here now on Drilling Deep. Everybody in trucking knows about cybersecurity. They should, following the recent hack on Estes Express, the LTL carrier. And a few years ago, Forward Air, another LTL carrier, was the victim of a cybersecurity attack. And just before Estes got hit, ELD provider Orbcom suffered the same fate. It took them all a few weeks to get back online, but it cost money and certainly a lot of stress. It could hurt the bottom line as well. And in the case of Forward, we know that it did. It was a publicly traded, it was and is a publicly traded company, and they had to provide estimates on how much it hit them, and it did. AT&T has recently produced a, or published a report on cybersecurity and transportation. It takes an approach toward where it talks about edge computing is at the heart of their recommendations re regarding cybersecurity. And I just went to a cybersecurity conference on trucking not all that long ago, didn't hear edge computing mentioned, so I really wanted to have a, our guest today, Teresa Lanowitz of AT&T, on. She's got a great title, Head of Cybersecurity Communications, Evangelism, and Portfolio Marketing. And she's here to talk about the findings of that report and what she thinks it means for transportation cybersecurity. So, Teresa... Welcome to Drilling Deep. Thank you so much for having me on the show, John. This is great to be here. So tell me what AT&T would do in cybersecurity beyond protecting its own, own rather vast systems. Uh, what, is your, uh, what is your portfolio targeted toward? Yeah, as you mentioned, AT&T has vast systems that our internal chief security office, they do an incredible job as, of protecting. And I can tell you as an employee of AT&T, we see it every single day regarding how much security is taken seriously and how they really protect us. Now, AT&T is a big organization, as you said, and I work for a team called AT&T Cybersecurity. And the way we operate and the way your viewers can really engage with us is we offer two ways. One is through our AT&T Cybersecurity Consulting Services, and the second is through our AT&T Cybersecurity Managed Security Services. So from the, from the consulting perspective, we have a very experienced group of cybersecurity consultants who can come in. They can work with you on red team exercises, blue team exercises. They can provide cybersecurity as a service through virtual CISO. They can come in and help you understand your cybersecurity posture assessment, help you create a plan to go forward if you're struggling with how to really get into the cybersecurity game. So that's our AT&T Cybersecurity Consulting Services. Our other is the AT&T Cybersecurity Managed Security Services. And that is providing managed services for things such as network security, endpoint security, and providing those managed services as an extension of your own security team. Those are the two ways you can engage with us. And then along with those two ways, the Cybersecurity Consulting and Managed Security Services, we have a team, our threat intelligence team, is called Alien Labs. And what they do is they provide threat intelligence. And that threat intelligence fuels everything we're doing on the managed services side, as well as everything we do on the consulting side. And as you said at the beginning, is cybersecurity is something that every organization needs to be concerned about. And what we also found from our at t Cybersecurity Insights report that we're going to talk about is that on average, 67% of people say that when they bring in a new type of computing, they want to look for that outside provider, that outside trusted advisor to help them on that path to implementing new ways of computing. Yeah, this is one of the things that I think I took away from that LTL cybersecurity conference 
is that it is worth it to spend the money to hire somebody on the outside who does this all the time. I mean, you should have your own people be up to speed, but but given that this is a field that's constantly changing, the idea that your own people who are just you know, like like most jobs, right? you're just trying to keep your job, keep the balls in the air every single day, being able to keep up with all the changes in technology, all the changes in technology, not just defending against cybersecurity, but all the changes that are going on at the bad guys, because they're getting smarter all the time too, that you really need that outside company to keep you abreast of what's going on. And that's one of the things that we, as I said, we learned that, and we have it in empirical evidence saying that people are looking for outsiders to help. But if you think about the way IT has evolved, just IT in general, over the past four or five plus decades, we've seen silos built up in companies of every type, every vertical market. It's not just in trucking or transportation. We have the development team that doesn't talk to the networking team, that doesn't talk to the operations team, that doesn't talk to the line of business. And the line of business is critically important as you go forward, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to use technology to help you innovate, to help you focus, to deliver better business outcomes. So for example, from a transportation perspective, you want to say, we want to use this technology such as maybe fleet tracking or route optimization to ensure that we're getting the best usage out of our drivers, the best usage out of the fleet that we have, so they're not sitting idling in traffic at some point. You want to be able to use technology to deliver those good business outcomes, and that's really where we're moving in the future. All right, let's talk about edge computing, because I read your report, and talking about edge computing was really at the core of it. As I said, I, you know, I spent two days in Houston talking cybersecurity and trucking. Can't say I really heard the term even once. So that really that kind of intrigued me when I saw the report. I wanted to hear what this was all about. So what is edge computing and why is it particularly important uh, in terms of trans in terms of cybersecurity in general and possibly transportation uh, protection against cybersecurity specifically? Indeed, that is interesting that you were at a cyber conference and you didn't hear the term edge computing once. Let's take a look at what we how we're defining edge computing for the purposes of this report and this discussion. Edge computing is its a pretty popular term. And if you go out in the general public and you ask 10 people what edge computing means, you'll probably get 12 different answers. So what we decided to do is we said for the purpose of this report, the purpose of this survey, we want to make sure that we have characteristics around edge computing. The first characteristic is that it is software defined. Your computing is software defined, whether that is in the cloud or on-prem. The second characteristic is that your workloads, your applications, your hosting, it's closer to where that data is being generated and consumed from that software-defined use case. And the third big characteristic is that it is a distributed model of management, intelligence, and networks. And you might sit there and say, okay, I heard those three characteristics that she just mentioned, but I'm still unsure. I'll provide you with a pretty easy example that I would say everybody has probably encountered in the last couple of years. You pull into a public parking garage, go to the first floor, you're greeted with a big digital scoreboard that says, there are two available parking spaces here. And you say, mm, you know, I really don't want to drive around, see if I can find those two available spots. So you go up to the second floor, take your chances. Again, you're greeted with that big digital scoreboard that says there are 50 available parking spaces here on this second floor. You say, great, that's much, much better. That's, in an essence, edge computing. Think about what has happened. You are being given information, digital first information, without opening an app. You didn't have to open an app and say, I want to park at the parking structure on 3rd and Maple. You just drove in. There's that big digital scoreboard. That software, is it's software defined, and it's delivering information right to you. It's not sending that information from that series of cameras and sensors in that parking garage back to a data center somewhere. It's sending it right to that digital scoreboard right to you. And so that's really where we are with, with edge computing. It is really about changing networks, networks that are lower latency, higher bandwidth, changing software, changing applications, applications that are ephemeral, headless, non-GUI. So you're not opening up your laptop or your phone or your tablet or something with a keyboard to really get information about everything and anything. And it is that digital first experience being served up to you with virtually no latency. So that's from an edge computing perspective. 
that's how we define edge computing and those three primary characteristics of edge computing. I mean, when I, when I first read your report, as I was reading it, what I kind of thought about was blockchain. Um, and, you know, the idea of blockchain being that uh, you're, 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 you're moving away from the idea of a centralized computer and the information is shared on the network. So if you wanted to hack it, you have to hack every single node that's connected to the blockchain, which is a rather momentous task. And by the time you got to the last one, somebody would have caught you and shut you down, presumably. And is that a, is that not an, a good analogy on my part? Blockchain more being the public ledger, but if you think about what edge computing is providing, it's that entire ecosystem. It is the network. It's the software. It's where the user is. The edge is where the user is. I see in your background there, you have some golf balls. So I think we should all assume that you're a golfer. And think about this. Think about if you were playing golf with an edge-enabled golf ball, and it went out of bounds, that edge-enabled golf ball would be able to deliver real-time information back to you about where that golf ball is. You know, you I like that, I like that idea. Right, let's get to work <laughs> on that at AC&C, okay? <laughs> we'll put that to the top of our priority list. Right. Edge-enabled golf balls. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> not, not with 142 golf balls behind me on the wall. <laughs> now, that's an example of edge computing. So edge is where the user is. Edge is in that parking garage. Edge is in that truck. Edge is in that container, in that container that might be carrying some goods on your truck. Edge is where that user is. And that's what's important to understand about Edge. And Edge is also bringing along that data with it, that data at rest, that data in motion, that data in use. So that data has to be protected, trusted, and usable. So Edge encompasses all of those things. It's those new networks, it's that application, it's that user, it's understanding where everything is and what everything should be doing and getting that data that gives you some sort of near real-time information that is valuable to you, whether you are a person or whether you are some other type of device. So it could be machine-to-machine -machine connectivity as well. All right, so let's then let's let it let it, let's go back to my blockchain analogy for a second. The idea that that can help protect against cybersecurity because the information is shared. I'm still not totally sure. I'm grasping how edge computing is a cybersecurity tool. It's not a cybersecurity tool. It's an enactment of different types of computing. So let's take a look at from our report. We identified four big transportation use cases. One is fleet tracking. The other is vehicle maintenance, the other is route optimization, and the third is autonomous vehicles. So if we look at autonomous vehicles, for example, the edge in an autonomous vehicle is constantly giving information back to that network about where that vehicle is, what that vehicle is doing, and it's constantly giving information to that vehicle. Can I make a left-hand turn safely here? Is there something that I recognize as a stop sign coming up here? So it is that near real-time information, that near real-time communication, fleet tracking. So you want to know where your fleet is at all times. That's a valuable asset that you have. So you want to know where that, that truck is, for example, but you also may want to know about the route that that truck is taking. Is that truck going on the most efficient route? Am I going to waste precious energy resources by having my driver sit in traffic where if they just made a two-mile diversion from where they were, they could easily get to their, to their destination much more quickly. So it's giving that near real-time information back through a series of devices, sensors, cameras, and so on. Okay. Uh, again, no, not really sure that I'm grasping the, the cybersecurity protection that that enables. So as I mentioned, it, 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 edge computing is not a cybersecurity tool. But what you have to do is all of those things that are contained in that computing environment, they need to be protected and secured. So think about your fleet. If you are tracking your fleet, if you are, let's go to the example of an autonomous vehicle. An autonomous vehicle is just a device out there driving along the road. You have to secure that autonomous vehicle. So you have to make sure that an adversary can't hack into the GPS system into the network system of that autonomous vehicle. And instead of saying, okay, I always stop at this red thing that's in the shape of an octagon, 
the if a, if an adversary gets in there, they can say, "Don't stop there." So you have to make sure that you are protecting your network and everything connected to that network from the adversary. So in the example of edge computing, you want to be able to use cybersecurity controls such as firewalls, such as zero trust frameworks, such as multi-factor authentication, such as um, uh, identity access management solutions, and so on. So all of these cybersecurity controls that we have in place now, we're going to take those and extrapolate those and use them for our edge computing use cases. Yeah, now we're kind of swinging back to maybe what were some of the things that we were talking about at the cybersecurity conference in Houston. Because when the when the conference opened, the first things that they were talking about regarding protecting your network were, you know, just almost ridiculously simple. You know, don't don't open up rogue links that you got from somebody you know. You change your password. Don't make your password password. You know, like re- real real basic stuff. And what was interesting, and I kind of was shaking my head, thinking, I really so I like I like Houston, but I came to Houston all the way for this. But by the end of it, by the second day, they were talking about you know real significant complexities in cybersecurity defense, and they were talking about the idea that the that the things out on the they didn't say edge. But things like trailers, you know, were now going to be potential threats for cybersecurity, and you got to protect those. So I think maybe we're talking about more or less the same thing now. Exactly, talking about the same thing. And you bring up such an excellent example with trailers, for example. Anything that is connected to the internet has to be protected. We see that across our day to day lives. You go to a doctor's office, you have point of sale, putting your credit card in go to the back office in your doctor's office, all of these different types of machines that are internet connection and are internet connected, taking your vital signs, for example. You go into a grocery store, point of sale payment. So anything connected to the internet, including our things at home, have to be protected. And you you brought up something really interesting about the basic hygiene that they were talking about at the conference you were at. And in our AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report, Focus on Transportation, we ask, what, where do you see attacks most likely happening on the edge? And it was interesting because our, our survey respondents who identified as being from the transportation industry, they are focused more on the, the, the social engineering aspects of breaches. They're looking at things such as account takeover as their number one concern. They're looking at things such as business email compromise, uh, personal information exfiltration. So those were the top three. And it also tied along with number three was nation state attacks. So if you look at transportation, transportation starts to get into critical infrastructure, looking at things such as business email compromise, account takeover, personal information exfiltration. Those are all social engineering tactics that an adversary would use. Business email compromise, for example, they want to get your email credentials to get in and spoof you. Say, yes, I am this person. I own this trucking company. And, oh, you owe, going out to a vendor saying, oh, you owe me X dollars. Just wire it to my account. Here's my account. Business email compromise. And then in terms of getting in and taking over account, just by pure brute force, using these tools that all the cyber adversaries have at their disposal, as well, we have those tools at our disposal as well, but weaponizing weaponizing those cybersecurity tools to just by brute force break into your account and take over that account, possibly post your site and start to collect data and information from its customers maybe skim credit cards and so on. So this this idea of social engineering becomes important for transportation companies to understand. And yes, it certainly starts with hygiene, as you were talking about. Don't click on those rogue links. Understand what you're doing. Understand who you're communicating with. Verify who you are communicating with. Making sure you have those checks and balances in place. That's critically important for transportation organizations to understand because that's where they see the most risk. Let's go to one sentence, one statement that was in the report that kind of caught my eye. Leaders in transportation are budgeting differently for edge use cases. Can you kind of expand on that? This is one of the greatest things we found in this survey because cybersecurity has traditionally been an afterthought. If you look around at any business out there, any transportation business, they will probably tell you 
will put technology into play. And if there's a cyber event or some type of cyber breach, then we'll go back and fix it. What we found in this survey is that across the board, people told us that they are equally investing among cybersecurity, applications, the network, and strategy and planning. Let's step back and take a look at that for a second. Planning. We really hardly ever hear about people doing a lot of planning. That's something that is fairly unusual. But as we start to move to these environments where it's about delivering business outcomes and it's about delivering this idea of a digital first experience, we have to say we need to plan and we need to plan across our company. We need to talk to our development team and our operations team and our networking team. And oh, by the way, the line of business as well. We have planning. We have the network. We look at edge. We're bringing in newer types of networks, networks that are lower latency and higher bandwidth. And then if we look at applications, again, those applications are different because in many cases, it's machine to machine discussion that's going on. It's not you opening up a tablet and saying, here's where I want to go or here's what I need to do. And then security. And security has long been an afterthought. But in this new world, in this next generation of computing that we're all going to, regardless of what our business is or how small or how large our companies are, we're all moving to this idea of edge computing. Security has that full seat at the proverbial table. They're thinking about security before they put the use case into production. So, so, so a final question, really, then. It sounds to me like you know, it, it, it's kind of almost hard to believe that anybody could be, well, we'll fix it later today, in, you know, in 2023. Sounds to me like you are seeing that sentiment kind of retreat that anybody who thinks that is is just so far behind the curve, they probably got other problems <laughs> beyond just cybersecurity. Is that a fair statement? It's a fair statement to say that the idea of having cybersecurity as an afterthought is on the retreat, but there are still organizations out there who may have never thought about cybersecurity. You speak to a lot of smaller companies, and in the transportation sector, you have a lot of smaller companies. And the attitude of smaller companies has largely been, it's a wait and see game, or we're too small. Nobody would ever want to hack us. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough information that anybody would want. But the reality is that those cyber adversaries, they play the long game. And while you may think you don't have enough money, you may not have enough information, they'll operate in a volume model. They'll get a lot of smaller companies who don't have cyber protection, and they'll, they'll take advantage of that. So yes, that is definitely in the retreat, but I wouldn't say it's 100% in the rearview mirror. One of the greatest, one, one of the, probably the only good thing that came out of the pandemic is that we saw security move from being a technical problem, a bunch of really smart people sitting over in the corner and people may not have known what they even did, but they would say, oh, those are our cyber people, to cybersecurity is now part of every business conversation out there. So the pandemic made that happen. The pandemic accelerated that. The pandemic said, you need to be focused on cybersecurity 100% as part of your business. So it is really, it's a business requirement. Yeah, but I took away one thing from the Houston conference. It's the view in the, in the industry is that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, we want to thank Teresa Lanowitz of AT&T Cybersecurity for being our guest today on Drilling Deep. Teresa, uh, I guarantee you that the next time I'm writing about some kind of cybersecurity attack and, trans attack and transportation, I'm going to give you a call. Well, thank you so much. And remember, cybersecurity is a journey, not a destination. Very good. Thank you. Anyway, you have been watching Drilling Deep. I'm your host, John Kingston. We are part of the Freightcast family of podcasts from Freightways. You can find us on all the leading podcast platforms. If you're seeing our faces right now, it means you're watching us on YouTube, but you can listen to us many, many other places. We do want you to join us again. Thank you.